So welcome, my name is Sven Schäge and I'm going to present you a talk on privacy preserving authenticated key exchange and uh, well, the application to IPsec or iKey uh, version 2. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Jörg Schwenk and Sebastian Lauer. Okay. So in classical key exchange, you usually have the setting where uh, uh, where there's two parties, Alice and Bob, and they want to communicate over an insecure channel. And uh, the, the goal of those two is to derive a session key that can be used to symmetrically protect the following data. So, and typically in classical key exchange, you want, as a security notion, you want that this key is indistinguishable from random so that you can plug in um, the symmetric security games quite nicely. So, but in throughout the internet, you, you can often find other settings as well, where you, for example, have a, a physical server machine that is hosting different virtual servers. And well, publicly there, there's only one endpoint, namely the, the IP address or the socket, the IP address and TCP and, um, and port. But behind that, there might be different servers running, different web servers, for example. One web server might be your out-of-the-box online shop, the give me new shoes.com or something. And the other one might be some government uh, the critical website that uh, contains um, um, the critical information and uh, might give rise to political persecution. So, um, this is actually a quite typical setting, for, for example, when using uh, the multi homed servers. But you might also consider the more general case where you have all the parties um, be equipped with more than one identity. Right? And in those settings, it might make sense to, um, to consider um, privacy mechanisms that tell, uh, that, that, that guarantee that the actual choice Alice uh, yeah, makes when, uh, when communicating with each of those web servers is actually hidden from the transcript, that no attacker can, can reveal if Alice is, uh, is, is accessing the government critical website or just uh, the, the online shop. Okay, and this paper is about formalizing that in a, in a very strong, strong sense and providing the foundations for that. Okay, so well, the motivation, of course, privacy. We want to have privacy, and there's no, there, there's no other motive to that. We just want to insist on privacy and, and have that Alice can can do that. That only uh, really necessary information is revealed um, about Alice. But there's also some some other um, benefit from. Um, from introducing such a model, namely circumvention of of, um, of censorship. And there are a lot of examples uh, where uh, the countries and governments, they do censorship based on, based on the concrete choice Alice makes, right? So typically this is done um, via server name indication. So if Alice actually tries to access the government critical website. Um, there's some there's some information that is in the in the clear to be found in the transcript and those um, um, censorship mechanisms they filter that out and, and block the website then. Okay so here's um, here's some remark. These security models are no substitution for Tor of course because Tor does uh, does the whole thing tries to provide privacy uh, from start to the beginning, but it, it rather begins to, to the network endpoint. It, it's, so this security rather begins where Tor ends, I would say. So um, Tor guarantees that your information is, um, is secure up to the network interface. And, and privacy preserving uh, AKE can guarantee that behind that ne network interface, uh, the user gets in some simple way right without additional in, without too much additional um, 
um, and costly mechanisms can get some privacy for its choice of um, virtual server. Okay. So the contribution in, in this work is we provide a security model. Um, and the, the benefit of that model is that it gives a very strong way to formulate security in the sense that it makes um, indistinguishability of identities, of use identities, and indistinguishability of, you, of, 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 of um, keys from random keys independent of each other. Those two properties are independent. So I'm going to explain what that means. Um, so, well, it's, it's a very general model, I'd say, and we, we rather regard it not as the, the final model, but rather as a set of ingredients um, that can be used to extend existing classical models to also provide um, um, the privacy-preserving property, right? So, and the way that, that uh, so, and, 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 these, and, and, and these ingredients should, should uh, they give a very sound way um, to construct privacy-preserving AKE, in the sense that the, the resulting new privacy-preserving protocol uh, model is, um, is a proper extension of the classical model. Right? This increases comparability. So everyone knows that in AKE research, there's a zoo of models. To not worsen the situation, we might um, um, and increase comparability. We might um, we we rather uh, provide some um, some building blocks to extend security models to also provide privacy um, the privacy preserving property. And there's also another um, the um, novelty in our in our work. Which is called modes. Modes um, help to capture the expectation of who is responsible for choosing some identities. Well, now Alice and Bob has two identities, and well, Alice might be responsible for choosing her own identity, and likewise Bob might be responsible for choosing its own identity. But uh, it might also be the case, as we have in our example that actually Alice chooses the identity that is going to be used for Bob. And our modes, they capture, the, they, they encode these expectations. And uh, well, they, they allow, and, and, they are, and, and they are public, uh, and they allow the attacker to adaptively um, um, make sessions communicate with each other that do not have uh, fitting modes, where the expectations um, um, well, diverge or clash. So, and finally, we provide the security proof, proof for IPsec with signature-based authentication. Okay, so here's a very simple schematic of um, of a security model, and this is just an extraction. So we have your yeah, party-related information, and we also have session-related information. For example, the session key is different for each protocol run. Now, what we introduce is uh, new session-specific information. And the first set of information is called public modes. And those public modes, they, um, they are encoding the expectations of who, is, uh, of who is responsible for choosing identities. So, for example, if this value, this value might be me or partner, is, is me, is said to me, then this means that Alice believes that she is responsible for choosing um, the secret key to, 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 um, to use and not Bob. Right? And likewise, if this value is going to be said to, to partner, she partner, she believes that Bob is responsible for choosing its own identity. Right? And those information are public. And this has the benefit that the attacker knows those information and can pit um, sessions of Bob and Alice with unfitting modes against each other, right? Um, and also those modes, because sessions might have different modes, they capture um, protocol options where still uh, each um, their protocol option relies on the same long-term key material. 
So they are not independent of each other. It doesn't make sense to 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 have them uh, to to have a look at them in a in a separate way. They are all they are all related to the same long term key material, but they are different modes. Okay. So and then there are the the actual choices of, of um, the actual choices of um, of the key material. Those values may be set throughout the protocol execution. So this value. The identity select a bit of Alice may be one or zero, and this value is going to say that Alice is using secret key A0, for example, if it is zero. And on the other hand, this value is going to, to, to um, state that this session is going to use public key B0 if the value is set to zero. Okay? So, of course, we also need to extend the attack capabilities. And since we have introduced new secret states as well, not only public uh, state information, namely those identity selector bits, we also give the adversary the possibility to adaptively reveal them. Right? And we have chosen to extend the test session. Now the test session has a parameter, an input parameter, either we do the classical stuff um, with a parameter key, or we um, choose identities to be um, as as um, to, to be to be given to the adversary as a challenge. So either the 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 identity of the long term secret key that this session is using, or the identity of the long term public key that Bob's public key that that Alice is. Uh, is using to authenticate incoming data with, right? Okay, now in the security experiment, correspondingly, each party is as um, equipped with two keys, and um, um, the 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 most critical point is that now in the security experiment, we have that each session that the attacker can always um, access all attack queries attack their capabilities. Also the unmask query. This has some, some consequences, right? So one consequence is that you, we cannot um, just reuse existing proofs because those existing proofs, they indeed may show um, the key indistinguishability of some protocol, but, only, but, they, but the analysis was not made in the presence of the unmask query. So one might come up with artificial examples of protocols where the um, unmasked query might give some information on the key used, right? So we to 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 actually use um, the previous proofs, we have to we have to fully revisit them and and have a look at whether they still hold in the presence of unmasked queries. So and this makes sense, well, because in well in in well, typical in in classical proofs, we want that um, independent of the used um, identity, key distinguishability is, is still guaranteed. And the classical security model, the adversary already knows because there's just one identity already knows the the identities of uh, initiator and responder, right? So. What we want is is that key indistinguishability holds. This is what we mean by um, cryptographic uh, independence. Key indistinguishability might hold even though uh, identity indistinguishability is violated, right? So this makes sense in, in, in practice because identity information are context dependent and um, might be leaked more easily and typically more easily than cryptographic keys which are uniformly random values, right? So there are other ways, uh, uh, there are other ways to reveal identity information. So in, in a sense, it, it might in some situations be more likely that identity information is revealed, but nevertheless, even if it is revealed, we want that um, it still key indistinguishably holds. And this is of course kind of a prerequisite for showing that our model is a proper um, extension of classical models. Because in those classical models, we have the very same situation. The attacker already knows um, the identities and still key indistinguishability should, should hold, right? As said before. 
And our model also aims to capture the opposite. Even though the cryptographic key is somehow revealed, we still would want that identities are indistinguishable. So this is what we mean by cryptographic independence between key and identity indistinguishability. Okay, so well, as we just view those building blocks on the unmaskery and those new state information possession as, as ingredients, we might also apply them to, to other security models. For example, authenticated key exchange with explicit authentication to the ACCE model or just to models that, that focus on unilateral authentication as well. So they might be adapted and uh, applied there as well. So the, the emphasis on having a strong cryptographic independence between those security properties. Okay, so now we come to the final part, uh, our analysis of IPsec and what we have learned from that. Um, so IPsec with signature-based authentication, and I, I would, so I, I should rather say IQ2. Um, the Internet Key Exchange Protocol as part of IPsec. Um, basically has an anonymous key, Diffie-Hellman key exchange in this phase um, and derives symmetric keys over here. So we have a closer look. And those keys are then used to encrypt um, the following data. And also the authentication mechanism is encrypted. Okay, so this is phase one. And basically what we have over here is that the, that there are some keys used in the next phase. And those keys depend on random nonces exchanged um, in the first two messages. And also on some, some secret S that works like a master secret. But this, this random secret S is, is, um, is derived from an anonymous uh, Defendman key exchange, g to the x um, times y, coming from big Y sent over and big X sent over. But now, using those keys, everything is going to be, in phase two, is going to be encrypted. So now what we encrypt is, what each party encrypts is also the authentication mechanism, and the authentication mechanism in this protocol is signature-based. So the initiator encrypts some signature, here's a signature, and sends over its identity and some signature, and this signature encrypts, um, is, um, is, is bound to its uh, secret key and can be verified with the corresponding public key, but also um, protects information that comes from the, from the first phase, right? So there's some interleaving of information. And likewise, the, uh, the responder also protects part of the, the messages and sent in the, in the first phase, right? In, in this way, these two parties guarantee that there has been no active adversary. Now, there are now two protocol options, and this is where we use modes. In the first mod, first protocol option, the initiator, this is the option, may send information on the identity that should be used by the responder. And in the second protocol option, since this is optional, there's no such uh, um, decision by the initiator. The responder may decide on its own which identity to use. Okay? So, what we can learn from the analysis and the security proof is that one has to be careful in these situations, right? So why is that? Luckily for signatures, this has, has worked out quite, um, quite nicely, but there is some, man writes, like strategically, man um, might run into, um, into circularities. Basically, Mm, the the signatures here they are used to protect the first phase. Without the signatures, the first phase has no no guarantee of of resulting in secure keys. But the secure keys they are needed to hide the identities. Right. So the secure keys are are needed to hide the identities and to encrypt all the data 
and protect the data from modifications. Right, so it, it kind of depends on the on, on the information here to protect the, the information in the uh, in the first phase, but the information in the first unit in the first phase is also used to protect the information in the second phase. But for signatures, this has worked out quite nicely. Also, uh, what we need as a take-home message is now that all identity dependent information should not only be encrypted but have the same length. So having two signature schemes, two different signature schemes, like, I don't know, uh, DSA or RSA-based signatures, would be problematic. So we can model that by requiring that the signatures have the same length, or either or um, to, to, to have length-hiding authenticated encryption uh, be used. Okay, and from, from the secret information, we then derive the actual session keys. Okay, so under the PRF audio assumption, assumption a, 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 um, an appropriate variant of that assumption, given that the PRF is secure, the signature scheme is secure, and if needed, that the signature scheme is length preserving, or that the, uh, that the authenticated encryption scheme is uh, length hiding, then this uh, PPIK scheme is is secure. Okay, let's conclude. Now we have a privacy preserving um, RKA model, I, um, authenticated key exchange model, and we emphasize strong independence between um, identity and distinguishability and key indistinguishability, right? This is one of our take home messages. And what we also have done is uh, is introduced modes to um, to cope with protocol options. Now and well, the proof for IPsec is <clears throat> is um, is not too complicated, but the take home message is when we deal with privacy preserving information, we have to make sure that um, all identity related information um, result in the same in the same transcript length, right? Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm glad to take um, their messages, uh, to take questions and messages, and in the uh, in the um, in the online phase of this talk. <laughs>